Today's lecture is on the historical perspective of rheology for polymer rheology and processing. What we first need to do is define what rheology is, and Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines rheology as a science dealing with the deformation and flow of matter. And rheology is also the ability to flow or be deformed. And this was a definition that was accepted when the American Society of Rheology was founded in 1929. At this particular society meeting, there were a wide scope of papers presented, and these were on things like asphalt, uh, lubricants, paint, rubber, and plastics. Our first historical figure in modern rheology is Eugene C. Bingham, uh, and the term rheology was actually coined by him, along with Marcus Reiner. He was a professor and head of the Department of Chemistry at Lafayette College in Easton, Pennsylvania. He was a pioneer in both rheology theory and practice. His legacy uh, today is what we see in Bingham fluids or Bingham plastics, and also the term Bingham stress. As a side note, uh, Bingham was also responsible for, one of the people was responsible for the construction of the Appalachian Trail, which is enjoyed by many to this day. Our next historical figure is Marcus Reiner. He was born in Bukov Bukovina, which is modern Austria-Hungary. He emigrated to Palestine to work as a civil engineer. After that, uh, he became a professor of engineering at the Technion, which is the Israel Institute of Technology in Haifa, Israel. And here we have a picture of him also. In his honor, the Technion later instituted the Marcus Reiner Chair in Mechanics and Rheology. His legacy is the Buckingham Reiner Equation, the Reiner Rivlin Equation, Reiner Rivlin Fluids, the Devra Number, which we will talk about extensively. Uh, in the future, and the teapot effect. And the teapot effect is an explanation of why tea runs down the outside of the spout of a teapot instead of into the cup. Now, we have the, we just talked about two of the modern fathers of modern rheology, but they stand on the shoulders of giants, much like the rest of us do in science, and they go back all the way to such individuals as Robert Cook. Robert Cook uh, came up with the true theory of elasticity in 1678, and this is a theory of classic elasticity. Elasticity is one of the concepts that we're going to talk about extensively uh, in this course. Uh, this is also known as infinitesimal strain elasticity, and this applies to solids. Uh, Robert Hooke lived from 1635 to 1703, and he coined the term cells. In other words, like body cells, plant cells, and things like that. He was the one that came up with the name. In terms of what he did for rheology, he came up with Hooke's Law. And Hooke's law is the power of any spring is in the same proportion to the tension thereof. So in other words, if you double the tension, you double the extension. And here we have a figure that shows Hooke's law. Uh, F spring uh, equals negative kx, where the spring constant is k. So you have an x unstretched spring. You displace it a distance of x uh, with a force F. It takes twice as much force to stretch the, the spring twice as far. Here we have another notable individual, uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton wrote the Principia in 1687, and the hypothesis associated with simple shearing flow is attributed to Sir Isaac Newton. And this is the fact that the resistance, which arises from the lack of slipperiness of parts of the fluid, all other things being equal, is proportional to the velocity with which the parts of the liquid are separated from one another. And in this case, lack of slipperiness is viscosity. So we're going to spend quite a lot of time on elasticity, and Robert Hooke, and then we're going to spend quite a lot of time on viscosity, thanks to Sir Isaac Newton. Here we have um, a simple Newtonian system. Here, sigma denotes the force per unit area, F over A, required to produce motion, in this case shear stress. Uh, sigma is proportional to the velocity gradient, or shear rate, which is U over D, the distance between the plates you have eta, which is the coefficient of viscosity. Um, it's referred to as the coefficient of viscosity in this slide only. From henceforth, we will simply refer to this as the viscosity of the liquid. So in this case, if you double the force, you double the velocity gradient. So sigma equals eta uh, times u over d, or sigma equals eta times gamma. And sigma equals eta times gamma is the common uh, relationship between Shear between shear stress and shear rate. Some liquids that obey this particular relationship are water and glycerol. 
and unsurprisingly, these are known as Newtonian fluids. Here we have two additional individuals. Uh, in the 19th century, Navier and Stokes developed a consistent three-dimensional theory for what is referred to as a Newtonian viscous liquid. And these governing equations are, unsurprisingly, known as the Navier-Stokes equations. And these are the equations. Um, you will not be responsible for knowing these equations, but you can, and you can see they're quite uh, intricate. Um, but these take into account all of the different forces within a Newtonian fluid. So, we have established that we have a Newtonian fluid and a Hookean solid. For simple shear, uh, a simple shear stress sigma results in flow. And flow persists as long as a stress is applied in Newtonian liquid. For Hookean solid, shear stress sigma is applied to the surface results in an instant deformation. Once the deformed state is reached, there is no further movement. And that deformed state persists as long as the stress is applied. So, the relationship in a Hookean solid is sigma equals g times gamma, and in this case, g is the rigidity modulus of the particular material. And here you have a figure that shows the state of deformation. From this point, from Hooke's law and Newton's law for liquids, uh, these things were accepted for about 200 years. In 1835, William Weber carried out experiments on silk thread, and this did not behave as a perfectly elastic solid. When a longitudinal load was applied, it produced immediate extension, and it further lengthened over time, kind of like a viscous liquid. When you remove the load, it resulted in immediate contraction with gradual further decrease over time. And so what he concluded was that even though it was a solid, it did not fit Hooke's law alone, like a spring. And so elements of this were more like flow, which were that of a liquid. So uh, rheology further evolved uh, at the hands of James Clark Maxwell, and he presented the dynamical theory of gases, and this was, appeared in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Here we have a picture on the left of the scientist himself, and on the right we have a picture of my parents' cat, which is uh, James Clark Maxwell also. Um, my parents uh, spent a lot of time working on Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism, and they inspired him to name their cat after the famous physicist. Uh, not, a re not over the rheology, but instead the uh, Maxwell's equations for light. Um, in the terms of rheology, the uh, physicist, not the cat, proposed a mathematical model for a fluid possessing elastic properties. Related to his equations for electromagnetism, though, these have been called the second greatest unification in physics after the first ones realized by Newton's, and those being the laws of motion. So the theory that electricity, magnetism, and light are manifestations of the same phenomenon can be attributed to James Clark Maxwell also. In the 20th century, there were only a few studies of rheological interest, that being in the first half of the 20th century. Um, a lot of the new and emerging studies on materials coincided with World War II, as many of the advances in plastics and materials did as well. Materials and flame flower throwers are viscoelastic, synthetic fibers, liquid detergents, multi-grade oils, non-drip paints, and contact adhesives were all used extensively in World War II and were studied for their rheological properties. Uh, there's been multiple advances in pharmaceutical, metal, medical, and food that involve bioreology, and a lot of biotechnical advances require the knowledge of rheology of those systems. So now we have a modern view of rheology. Uh, the extremes that we just talked about, in other words, Newtonian fluid mechanics, which are governed by Navier-Stokes equations, and classical elastics theory, which are governed by Hooke's law, are viewed outside the scope of modern rheology. Modern rheology seeks to study the materials that fall in between these extremes. So, Weber's silk thread, a viscous solid, and Maxwell's gases, or elastic fluids. And these are considered viscoelastic materials. So, revisiting the definition of rheology. It is a science that deals with the deformation of flow of matter or the ability to be deformed. And rheology is concerned with material characterization that exhibits a combination of elastic, viscous, and plastic flow behavior. It also seeks to establish predictions for mechanical behavior based on micro or nanostructure of the material. And this is governed by polymer si molecular size and architecture, as well as particle size distribution within a solid suspension. Thank you very much.